control of the radio system, whether it's VHF or satellite. All right, so uh, things we're going to breeze through, common problems, and then we'll talk about power plan. Um, and again, there's a lot of detail to go through that we won't get into. Um, hopefully, we can come back and do some do some uh, subsets of this. Um, Eighty percent of the failures that we see are installation related. So, equipment mortality is a is a is a is a minor problem these days. Equipment is generally very reliable. So, when there is a problem, we uh, we spend extra time thinking about um, you know did we install something incorrectly, or if we're coming back to look for a problem that uh, that we didn't install, that we question the installation first, right? And where these failures take place is with connections. So there'll be connectors that are wires that have been crimped together. Sometimes we see wire nuts, which are completely illegal. Um, we uh, will see stuff twisted together with a wad of tape or connections just put in inappropriate places um, below floorboards and what have you. Uh, so when trying to seek out a problem, let's not start with the equipment. Let's start with the wiring first and see whether we can find some answers there. Uh, an example, this was a uh, VHF connector that was underneath the floorboards, unprotected. Um, this happens to be nice and shiny. They usually are green and gross. Um, these are uh, connectors that were low in the bilge um, and, uh, and unprotected. You know, So we would like to see if we're going to make a connection like that, we would like to see that in a waterproof junction box, especially if it needs to be in a vulnerable place. Can I jump in? Yeah, go ahead. Here. Real quick, guys. My name is Ben Mercer. I work with Scott Eason, and I've been under their tutelage in the electronics business for about the last seven years. Uh, I want to touch on heat shrink really quickly. Just because you have something that's heat shrunk does not make it watertight. It protects part of the connection, but you still have to protect, protect the connection that's at the junction box. And anything on a small boat, anything on a small boat, like a Moore 24 that a lot of people are going to go on this year, you have to assume that nothing in that boat is safe from water, humidity, anything of that nature. So going through a boat, and you'll notice here, there's two different types of connections. You have heat shrink here, and you have uninsulated here. So it's important to make sure on smaller boats, and even if you have any question, to use heat shrink, but to make sure everything's covered in anti-corrosion, dielectric silicone, something that's going to keep that junction free from water. Yeah, and Ben Ben brings up a good point, which is um, the our philosophy is uh, all of these connections are designed to work for you know a lifetime if they're kept dry. So you know I often get questions about is there a spray that we can put in a connector to help solve the problem or what have you? No, let's let's work on what the problem really is, which is water getting in. So let's keep the water out. And then these connect are industrial connectors, typically. I mean, they, you know, high quality connectors and, uh, and they'll last a lifetime. Um, so keep, keep the water out to start with. Uh, following on Scott's mantra, inspect everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything. I mean, start at the bow with the bow running light, take it apart. Is it gonna fall apart and, and be all crumbly? Well, then, you know, that needs to be addressed. Is the wire green? Let's replace the wire. Um, story I have about the early in my career, which was quite an eye opener, which uh, the boat of San Francisco Yacht Club, little boat, had a had a stern length that was all rotted. It wasn't working. Was the, the symptom? It was all rotted out, and uh, it had been leaking, and it leaked into the wire that was going to the stern length. And just for fun, I started clipping that wire back to see if I could find any. Uh, nice shiny copper. It was a small boat, like 30 foot boat, probably a 30 foot run of wire. I followed that wire all the way to the nav station and it was green and then black, which is the precursor, all the way to the nav station because water will wick through the wire. So the message here is uh, 
know your boat, inspect everything, and some things that we'll do is in areas that, you know, we'll, uh, let's say there's a wire run that's going under a bump, I'll actually get my hand down there and, you know, feel that wire loom to see whether there's anything, any hidden treasures, right? So whether there's a, a splice down there. Um, another uh, telltale is if there's a wire that's one, uh, one construction at one end, but it comes out of the cabinet, a different, a different piece of wire, um, then you know that there's something in between that needs to be inspected. It might be soldered and heat shrinked and done beautifully. Okay, um, typically not. So get to know your boat. One, one thing I want to touch on on that point is not all wire is created equal. And unfortunately, I think the shortcoming in the hardware side of things is that a lot of the wires that you'll see are copper. I'm a big fan of tinned wire because it's going to have a little bit more corrosion resistance. Uh, and on the aspect of going through your wire and feeling around for those hidden treasures, one of the biggest dangers, in my opinion, is when you've got somebody who's come along and zip tied on over other zip ties, mm. and the zip ties clipped at a 45 degree angle and it's razor sharp. Well, it seems like that wire's secured in there. Like Scott said, these boats are going to take a pounding at some point or another, and that's like going around a hard corner without some kind of shape protection. It's going to eat through that wire at some point. And after this is over, if you guys want to come to my computer, I have pictures of a boat that had seven different breaks in the wires in the mast that were shorting across from all different kinds of reasons, chafe, sharp edges in the mast. So just making sure that you know what's going on in that boat and making sure everything is clean, smooth. There's not splices where there shouldn't be splices. Yeah, and um, and you touched on some great stuff. So uh, uh, tie wraps over tie wraps, just aesthetically illegal. Um, but uh, you know, so, you know the, the technical side of it is that you want to be able to trace wires and, and you know, again, back to Scott's point that this happens at two in the morning sometimes. Um, make it easy on as on yourself as possible. Um, and uh, and the, the the tie wrap cut at a forty five degree angle, the electrical equivalent of a meat hook, right? Um, You'll figure it out when you see electricians and they have stars all over their eyes. And you know, so again, reaching into a locker uh, at night, you know, whether it's for an electrical reason or just for a stowage reason, let's keep that stuff nice and clean. Um, I'm a, uh, uh, a pretty strict with my guys about using very flush, flush cutters. So uh, you can get uh, diagonal cutters that have a little chamfer on the on the cut side, but that still leaves a nub on your tie wrap. Get some absolutely flush cutters. Uh, workmanship. So you know, getting back to uh, tie wraps and how things ought to be ought to be done. I equate it to, uh, you know, you wouldn't just throw dishes into your cupboard and have some ragtag um, uh, assembly of, uh, of stuff in your kitchen. And, you know, so examples are, you know, sort of mishmash of, of uh, extra wire. Um, things aren't labeled here at all. We don't know what's what. Um, you know, electrically, the transducers that are of this mess here um, don't care you know it's extra wire but we don't need that extra wire so let's let's either cut it out and cut the wires to length um, then this was just somebody just not taking the extra effort and or if it's a pre-terminated wire that we need to uh, keep cut or keep to length because it has a, a connector on the end let's do a tidy job of securing that stuff. You can imagine this is below a, a settee. So if they were to throw stowage in here, um, you know, those wires are vulnerable, right? The boat rocks around and whatever you stow in there is gonna start to pull on those wires. Um, example of something a little more tidy, uh, and these are all labeled. This is an NMEA 2000 network in this junction box. Um, and pretty much everything is NMEA 2000 now. A huge bonus is to label where everything is going. Um, if, when you need to troubleshoot, those wires all look the same. 
So when you need to troubleshoot, you really need to know where those things are going. Otherwise, you're going to spend a lot of time tracing things down. I think on the, on the note of labeling things, it's important to label everything. Everything that comes into your, into your junction box or your panel in your boat, you never know what you're going to have to trace. And it's a lot easier to open that panel, see what you have, and know where you're going versus looking at the back of the panel, counting how many circuits down, and then going, okay, I think that's the one. So making sure everything is labeled front, back, it just allows you to identify things quickly when you do have an issue. Yeah, and the, the, the other part of that is the systems are more and more complex. What you can do for $10,000 now was a $30,000 or $40,000 package, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So um, with that complexity, you know, we'll do, we'll often do a, a system drawing for a boat showing all the parts and pieces and where they're located and showing the wires in between a schematic. But at two in the morning, you don't really want to get out the piece of paper or reference it on your computer. Be way easier to be able to look at the labels on your wire. It'll cut your troubleshooting down, um, cut the time down considerably. Um, and this is on the Piwak at 68. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of stuff crammed into one spot there. So it's instruments, autopilot, ships network, uh, serial interfacing, uh, GPS, um, you know, ships Wi-Fi. Yeah, that's, that's what it could look like. I want to touch on something. If we can go back one slide, this box is called a rose enclosure. Uh, when we talk about that junction box that's down in the bilge, that's a watertight box that we would put glands on so the cables can go in and out in a watertight pass through. These come in all shapes and sizes. We have a more 24 that we're doing in the shop right now that we're going to get a box big enough to fit this entire situation so that the entire electronics package is sealed. It'll have the, pan the back side of the panel, which will be a waterproof panel on the front side. All the instrumentation will be sealed simply to keep water out. And one of the things that I always recommend to people is anytime you get some desiccant packs in a pair of shoes or anything, I'll individually package a couple of them with a food sealer. And as the race goes along every day or two, if you see moisture build up on this, cut one of those food sealer bags open, throw a desiccant pack in there, keep that stuff dry. Water is the enemy in this situation with electronics. Yes? Desiccant. Silica gel? No, the, the boxes. Uh, oh. There's all types, but normally rose enclosures are very nice. Yeah, rose enclosures are nice. And one of the things that we look at on the, uh, for the, uh, when we're shopping for enclosures is uh, stainless screw. They typically all have stainless screws to hold the lid down, but a lot of them have brass inserts, and uh, rose makes enclosures with stainless inserts. Um, but but does as well. A couple other manufacturers. Another another one that's nice for small format. Uh, West Marine sells small Pelican cases in a variety of shapes that have quick latches, but they have a nice heavy duty rubber seal with a vent. And those can be cut open on the backside, potted down with a sealant like silicone or 4000 UV, and it creates a nice watertight enclosure. So. Uh, Back to my statement about how systems can be complex. Um, keep complexity below your threshold, your pain threshold, right? So um, you might have the budget to go super complicated, but does it serve you? And so one of the things that we do, there's sort of an interview process that goes on. How are you going to use the boat? What are your goals? You know, how long are you going to have the boat? Um, you know, you know, what type of, of sailing are you doing? Um, you know, how, how competitive you want to be. Um, and, you know, so we'll tailor a package that meets those needs. Um, it's, it's, it's easy to get into technology overwhelm. Um, you know, it really comes back to what are your goals? And uh, so it's just a conversation to have. Uh, we talked about labeling, knowing your systems, inspecting. Um, Inspect again, really. I mean, go from bow to stern. It's it's not. Uh, it might take you a day, you know. But really, get into every locker, and uh, and see if you find any uh, 
uh, any treasures. And, and utilizing your system. I can't tell you, just touching on the anchor light, steaming light, stern light issue, LED is a great way to go because it takes a lot of that fudge factor out. I can't tell you how many times I'll go to the top of the mast, pop an anchor light off, everything's corroded, have one of the guys flick on the switch, and you have to kind of jiggle the bulb to get it to go. And you'll see boats out on an anchor at Angel Island on a windy night, and the anchor light's just flicking because it's losing contact and the bulb's jiggling around. But something we'll touch into later is power consumption, and LED is a great way to go for that, as well as being able to reduce wire size. But familiarity with the systems is important, not just when you're sitting at the dock and the situation is behind, but looking at stuff under sale, making sure it works, testing everything. Yeah, and that's I, I, I think is a great point, which is which is inspection in my mind includes running everything. Um, and you know we use our boats intermittently. And so being an expert on the systems on your boat is hard. I mean, it takes seat time. Uh, you know, so whether it's your satellite phone or being comfortable using your VHF radio, which we hardly ever do, um, the more you have your hands on these things, um, the, the better off you'll be when you uh, slip the line for a package. Um, you know, it's not uncommon that, uh, in fact, is totally common. I hear people say, well, you know, it took us a couple of days to get used to using the Iridium. Well, you know, if you had activated that Iridium system a couple of weeks before and spent those some of those two weeks uh, testing it out, then your familiarity would make it more comfortable for you the first couple of days. Um, okay, so this, this may, this half, for the energy management worksheet may not be valid. This is a fact um, I did about four years ago for a talk. Um, but I'm not exactly sure what we're looking at in the, other than the fact that it's a spreadsheet that has all of the items. This is, I think, their anticipated use. To, to me, it looks like with new technology, LEDs are cutting down on consumption. Much of this stuff anymore, SSB is not a requirement. SATCOM's coming down in, in draw. Um, weather facts is going to be taken care of by SATCOM. But much of the instruments, much of the instrumentation and the infrastructure as far as lighting is getting better. And I think it's important to make a concerted effort to move towards LED and to know what your system draws. And that's in a functional usage again, going out sailing, using it during a race, power consumption monitors are going to be key to developing this list. Yeah, and I, I've got a slide on that coming up, but, um, you know, part and parcel of that is uh, do your energy budget based on real measurements, not on the spec sheets. Uh, so the spec sheets are, are wildly wrong sometimes. And I, I think that they just, uh, I'm not sure how they get there. Maybe it's just worst case scenario, they have to put a number down on, on their on their brochure, um, but actually do measurements. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. This was um, more 24 Moss, uh, got good guys. They, they um, are a detailed bunch. They had, uh, I believe these were real measurements that they had made in doing their budget and a comparison with um, how much they actually used up. And the one thing that stood out to me here was uh, instruments daytime, they thought they were going to um, draw seven amp hours a day and they ended up not turning the instruments on at all. I don't know what that's about. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> they lost the Oh, what was that? They lost the solar panel. Is that in 2016? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, that would explain why they didn't turn the instruments on. I think there's another concept, too, that, that we're touching on in, in real time right now at our shop is we're using this as a basis for the boat that we're building now. And it's a double handed boat, and one person is going to want the instruments. The other person is basically a professional sailor. 
We said turn them off during the day. When you're on a small boat like that, there's touch-ins and feel, and if the instruments help you sail better, absolutely. Will Paxton and Zach Anderson. Will doesn't want to sail with the instruments. He didn't need them. He knows where he's going, knows what the feel is. Zach needed the instruments. One place that instruments are really going to help is at night. If it's dark, if you can't see, if you need it, you're going to be sailing downwind for a portion of the, for a good portion of the race. True wind angle is going to really help you have a stabilizing factor to drive to. So instruments at night are helpful during the daytime. You can see the kite better. You can see the waves. You're driving. You can sail to a compass course that the navigator provides on a, on a every other ship briefing. So you, you figure out what you really need to use. And if you don't need to use it, it's important that you turn it off. Uh, yeah, again, I'm not sure if um, these paths are, uh, to find these spreadsheets are still valid, but um, they will be out there someplace. Um, yeah, so again, my comment, test it yourself. Uh, an energy monitor is a must-have. Um, there's a, a slew of different types out there, um, and you know what. In a nutshell, what this does is it puts a sensor, which is called a shunt, uh, in your uh, in in the negative feed to your battery, and um, it measures current in. And current it actually just measures how much current is flowing. If there's solar panels putting in and you have instruments drawing out or whatever is on your electrical system, it'll be the net, right? So you have charging going in and consumption coming out. The energy monitor will show you that that net amount. Um, it gives you a highly accurate uh, reading of battery voltage. Um, I think Ben will probably talk about uh, lead batteries and lithium batteries and what the uh, uh, what the, the some of the differences are there when you're looking at battery voltage. Um, but this is a pretty essential tool uh, to keep you. Uh, to keep, yes. Hi. Would you use that to check the consumption of every single instrument by turning every Certainly. Off? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's enough, right? To yeah. get a good approximation. Yeah. Well, and you don't actually have to turn everything off, right? Because if you have if you have some stuff on and it's reading, you know, 6.8 and you yeah. turn turn a light on and it reads 7.0, then, you know, that's 200 milliamps of, of draw right there. Um, I think the important thing to remember with these two is, is something we'll get into with instrumentation as the garbage in, garbage out principle. The shunt on a battery monitor's placement is incredibly important. We have a client that's in now who's got three or four different battery monitors and the shunt or the readings are from all over the place. So they don't account for voltage drop. They're not telling you what the batteries are actually doing. So your panel monitor only tells you what you're getting from that power source of the panel and it doesn't take into account anything behind the panel. So having that battery shunt as close to the battery as possible is the precise location if we want to see those shunts. So you see everything coming in and everything going back out. So it's really important to make sure that that placement takes into account everything. So something on this monitor is uh, this amp hour number, which it's doing a calculation of how much uh, capacity is remaining in the batteries. Um, that's a pretty tricky thing. It's different with different battery chemistries. Um, it needs to uh, it needs to be reset in the sense that uh, it needs to know when the batteries are fully charged and that's sort of its starting point. Um, so it, it, uh, we won't delve into that, but just to say that that's not a set it and forget it uh, uh, number. It, it takes some attention and, and some knowledge about how the number is being generated so you don't get garbage. And um, yeah, so uh, similar to, to Scott's uh, statement about um, spares, uh, you should be carrying some spares. Um, enemy A2000, you should have uh, a couple of spare cable lengths, uh, T's, um, you know, just a, a very mild mishmash of enemy A2000 because it's, it's a connectorized system. It's, the connectors are, the cables are terminated 
in connectors that, and there are field connectors, but they're not something you'd want to be dealing with out in the middle of the ocean if you can help it. Um, other wire offcuts, the appropriate tools, and um, at a, maybe in another seminar, I'll bring my toolkit and I can show everybody. Um, I can do 90% of my work with a, you know, 10 pound bag of tools. Um, we can go through the whys and wherefores. Um, and uh, you know, connectors, tape, um, colored electrical tape is fine as long as it's not black. I don't <laughs> ever want to see black electrical tape on a boat. It just turns to goo. It's, it's, it has no, I don't know why they make it. Um, spare belts, uh, for sure, for your alternator. Um, and shear pins, uh, if appropriate. Don't see shear pins often, but uh, in some applications. I just want to touch on something quickly. Um, when we talk about having to do wire repairs on the water, I'm a big fan of heat shrink may not be realistic out there. And in most cases, it's not going to be. I can't foresee myself down in a very tight enclosure with a torch or have AC powered around a heat gun. Um, so having self amalgamating tape to wrap that connection in when you do make it to seal the water out. So having heat shrink terminals for, for repairs, you can have them. They do provide nice support on the back side of the wire, even if they're not heat shrunk. But if you can't use heat shrink, it's great to self amalgamate the fittings. That way they're watertight and they're clean. One thing I do want to touch on is newer instruments, LED wires, 22, 24, 26 gauge wires, very tiny wires. And when you do try and heat shrink them, there's not enough covering to dissipate the heat. You can melt the cover like that. So making sure that you talk to somebody who's got information on connector technology with crimps that you heat shrink with normal heat shrink, not heavy gauge, the heavy plasticized heat shrink that comes on a heat shrink terminal. Yeah. There are more options out there and you can get into a little bit of trouble even with the crimping that you do of those small gauge wires where you can just crimp clean through them. You think you've got a good fit, yeah, yeah. get a little tug and the thing pops off. Immediately. Yeah, and it's a, it's a great point. So as the wire sizes get smaller, um, it takes a little more finesse and, um, you know, for high-end race boats with, you know, ultralight mass cables and all that, we'll get down to a 24 and 26 gauge wire. Um, typically, the, the wiring that you're going to see, you know, if we're running LED wire, is it'll be 22 gauge or 20 gauge, it's still reasonably manageable, but uh, fence points are good ones about, um, you know, you, you need to, yeah, it's finesse, right? So no gorilla, um, gorilla crimps. Um, and what do you think of the like a liquid electric tape? Not us, not them. Out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the and the and I was just thinking of this case that you couldn't be sure. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, but the problem is that it's you're probably not going to get rid of it after your emergency repair, right? So. Um, the liquid electric tape, the issue with that is that it's, uh, it ends up becoming brittle. And uh, so then moisture gets in and it just holds the moisture in. Yay. Um, self amalgamating tape, Scotch 2242 is the only material we use. Um, I discovered it, I don't know, probably 15, 20 years ago. And um, we've used it exclusively. It's, it's, UV resistant, uh, it's linerless. Um, there's a technique to using it that I can show in another seminar, but it's it's definitely the right material to uh, to, and it's it, it'll make a completely waterproof connection. It's about stuff. Yeah, we in conjunction with that, we also use the rubber weld and uh, self amalgamating tape, especially on VHF fittings. The thing you have to be careful with a uh, self amalgamating tape you need to stretch to get adhesion. Some of the more rubberized self amalgamating tapes are great because they can be molded around these delicate connections. So they make a more watertight connection. Once you start having to pull with these little connectors, there's not a lot holding those connections together. So you need to be delicate with the smaller wires. That being said, unless you're using these devices that have small wires on 
specific things like running lights, and, and there's a list in the Pack Cup SERs. Some of these electronics require only a 3% voltage drop. So not every application is great for these ultralight wires, and you need to make sure incandescent lights draw much more than LEDs, up to two to three times more. And they generate heat. So you need the you need the proper wire size to the fittings that you're using. Just something to keep in mind. Yes. Do you recommend that uh, a cell sealing heat shrink or what's it called? Oh, uh, what type of heat shrink? Um, yeah. So the, there's two types of heat shrink. There's linerless and, and line or dual wall, or dual wall, they'll call it. Uh, the dual wall heat shrink has a heat activated glue. So when you heat it, the glue gets soft and uh, that's what gives us a waterproof heat shrink. So we would only use that. I mean, I carry both, um, but 90% of what we do will use the, uh, the, the dual wall waterproof heat shrink. The only time I'll use the, um, the single wall uh, heat shrink would be on some interior connection that I might then make waterproof either with an overall jacket of waterproof heat shrink or self amalgamating tape, or if it's in a junction box where it's going to be waterproof. Um, but yeah, it, we, we almost always, and the only, actually just to follow that, the reason I would use the single wall heat shrink is typically um, for a space constraint. So if I'm doing a splice, uh, in a wire that I don't want to get, I don't want it to get really bulky because the dual wall heat shrink is bulkier. Then I'll use that single wall and then cover it with a overall jacket of waterproof heat shrink. Um, yeah, we don't do splices very often, but sometimes, uh, especially in a refit situation where uh, we're moving an instrument or an electrical panel or something, and uh, we need to extend a wire. Um, so we try to avoid that whenever possible. And there's even, you know, the thought process at the time is, can I just run a new wire instead of extending this piece of wire? Um, I would like to have a single piece of wire going from my, from my distribution to my load. Um, and if it's an electrical, an electrical wire. Um, any other questions quickly? I'll move on. Yes. Do you care to uh, recommend a uh, solar panel? Ah, recommending solar panels? Um, I, no. <laughs> um, I, you know, so, I mean, a funny story. I, uh, uh, I've got a camper and I put a solar panel, uh, one of these flexible solar panels, it's, I don't know, it's like 120 bucks or something for a 100 watt panel on the roof of my camper. It failed. I got a replacement. It failed. And then I stepped up to $150 panel, which is a, a sun power, a proper sun power panel, um, and it's worked flawlessly. Um, the solar panels are tough because they're, they're a lot of it um, is boat specific. You know, where you're going to mount it, how you're going to mount it, how the wiring does the wiring need to exit the back and it exit the top and then still make it gracefully into the boat without being a hazard. Um, there's a lot of consideration. So. And I, I actually, I was looking in, uh, wasn't for you guys, was uh, looking into this yesterday for somebody else. And um, uh, Solvian is, they're super expensive, um, but they kind of make what we like to use. Um, so they're a European company that's, uh, they they're expensive panels. Um, okay, so uh, electrical, uh, back to the theme of testing, and again, this would also fall under the umbrella of inspecting, um, that we want to uh, we run the engine, run it under load with the batteries discharged, see how the, are the belts tracking, is there a lot of chatter in the belts, um, is there uh, uh, belt dust accumulating that then may be a concern that there's extra wear on that system. Um, the uh, I, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to drill down into this, um, but about you know alternator sizing, um, and C trials and testing, which I've already touched on. Um, I think are you know I won't I won't beat that into you anymore, but it's 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 important to get time with your equipment.
And um, last but not least for me <laughs> is get it done early. Um, if you're working on this stuff now, we love you. you call us in April and we're like, what were you thinking? Um, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna do this, if this if if you know you're gonna be slipping the lines for pack up, um, let's let's start talking sooner rather than later. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times from the rigging standpoint and the electronics because it goes hand in hand for me where somebody calls and says, it's it's February, we got a boat, we want to get it ready to go, yeah. and that's a very limited amount of time to do it and. What ends up happening is it doesn't give anybody any seat time testing, and it becomes a huge issue with safety. We want we want you guys to try and plan as soon as possible. And the other thing is, good guys are booked. Well, yeah, and, and materials too. I mean, I, I know everyone's experienced supply chain problems, whether it's you know getting toilet paper or whatever. Um, you know that that we. I've got stuff that's been on back order for three or four months. So and it's only getting worse. So it's just foresight to be prepared. I know sometimes a year and a half before you may not have a boat or you may be going with somebody else. Things change, but just trying to have the keep best that, possible. Yeah, keep time. that in the front of your mind that you know sooner we can get stuff going. Yes. Yeah, you mentioned test, test, test. What about during the race? Is there something specific for electronics that you should either look for or check? Daily, um, not so much, you know. Other than you know, if you've had an extraordinary event, like you got a water, a lot of water below, or um, something like that, then then you might do. So the question was, is there is there other inspection stuff that you should do during the race? Um, you know, if it's all situated nicely before you leave the dock, things are waterproof. Um, and um, yeah, but it, it, you know, I, it, it, I think there are some that I would recommend deck step masks, glands, wires exiting the mass base that don't run internally through a compression post, glands, SSB cables, GPS cables coming up off the stern of the boat to a stern rail. Somebody goes back there to use the bathroom or to stack sails or whatever the case may be. Making sure those connections aren't damaged. A jib sheet can catch it. A spin sheet can get wild when the boat lays over and hook a GPS cable, or worse, your SSB cable uh, or your SATCOM cable. Anything that runs above deck, anything that's in the line of fire, doing the best to protect it, but also to inspect it, just like you would do your daily or morning, morning or evening walk around to the boat for the rigging. Anything that's subject to movement. Heel step masts. I can't tell you how many masts the spar makers put the exit right up against the headboard liner, and that mast is going to have some movement, making sure that those wires where they pass into the mast, they're not developing any change. So, just things things that you can access. Some boats it's not practical to access the entire system, but one thing I will say, just to but, put a button on this topic, J boats. Uh, high performance offshore boats that have aluminum that have steel stanchions with a brace. J111s, J125s all have a brace that lands right on top of the instrument box. If that stick, if that support's not watertight, you just have the drip. Yeah, drip. actually, that's actually a great point. So, you know, in, in the sense of inspection, yeah, maybe just opening your electrical panel because it's usually out. Uh, the, on the outboard side of the of the boat and with the hull on the as the back of the box of the panel, so that that would be a good thing to inspect. Uh, Question from TV Land. Oh yeah. Uh, Carl Robrock, somewhere out there, asks uh, any particular areas where you would advocate for redundancy. Hello, Carl. Yes. <laughs> everything. We, we should hold up the mirror. I see Carl. <laughs> um, Off the top of my head, redundancy. Um, well, spare VHF antenna, which I don't remember. It is required. It's, it's on there? Okay, good. Um, and um, spare VHF antenna or emergency VHF antenna, um, I highly advocate having the real deal. So the, the 36 inch antenna that I brought as a um, prop back there to look at. Um, when my rig comes down, I want to have a good VHF antenna, you know. So that's a, a full 
uh, 3D B antenna that's um, that's ground independent, and um, and so we we package that antenna with whatever cable length you need to get from somewhere up on deck down to the back of your VHF radio because your rig's now in the water. Um, so that that would be one obvious thing. Um, I don't know. Well, you know, I mean, I, we talked about you know having parts and pieces, but redundancy on equipment. I don't, I don't think it's ever a bad idea, especially on a larger boat with a bigger mast. Uh, I like to have a spare duplex run from the panel that's labeled spare to the mast head to the mast base, just in case you have some kind of wire fatigue in the boat somewhere. Spares of fuses, connectors, I mean, anything that you can think of that you might replace, it's a great idea to have spares. Uh, spare, spare wind instrument if you're seriously racing. A spare wind, yeah. wind instrument and maybe um, probably not a spare cable, although some boats are installing two cables, wind, uh, wind instrument cables. Yeah, I, I think a lot of that stuff too, it's important to remember when you hear Scott or I or Eric talk about some of this stuff, there's a huge difference in the level. Not everybody's going to send somebody up a rig. Race programs that have bow guys that are capable of going up, I mean, there's a great story from the Lucky Duck this year in Transpac where they lost all their halyards. They sent all three of their bow guys up and the 62 year old guy ended up going up because he was the only one that could do it. He spent four hours up the mast trying to fix an issue at the mast. Head. So it's not realistic. It's just trying to be as prepared for the scenarios that you're going to encompass. Okay, so um, one more. Yeah, okay, one more. One more. I just want to say question. it's been a pleasure talking to you all. I've got a scoot. Um, I'm going to leave these parts with Ben. There's different size coax back there. There's the biggest one is sort of the, uh, um, we, we hardly ever use it, um, but it's just there to kind of for shock factor because it's, it's huge. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me or, or certainly to Ben uh, with any questions. And I'm going to turn it over to Ben to get into some additional mm -hmm. yeah. sorry, sorry, one more question. You mentioned a scratch tape that was scratch 242? 2242. It's a, a rubber self-amalgamating tape. It's black. It's black. It needs to be black. It needs to be black. <laughs> it's not electrical tape. <laughs> <laughs> <Mike>. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, and th th that particular tape, uh, you, you cut off a piece uh, and it stretches to 300%. So you need to give it a pre-stretch before you start wrapping it on. Cut You'll the end off where your greasy fingers have been. Wrap it around with a little bit of tension. It doesn't have to be a lot of tension. And then when you get to the end, let it relax and roll it over. And within 15 minutes, it, it'll be fused to itself. You have to cut it off. All right, Paul, thank you very much. Great. Thanks a lot, Eric. Eric has an 11 o'clock appointment at Point Reyes, and he yeah. graciously oh. agreed to, to help us out today. So, big thanks to Eric. Yeah. Um, we are going to get uh, more of the Ben and Eric show with Eric, with Ben here. Um, but before we do, uh, let's do a raffle. Um, let's see, what do we got here? Yeah. Oh, and we also have to, oh, a note about the drinks at the coffee table. Um, the drinks are uh, to go with the lunches. If you want to grab your drink early and drink it before your lunch, that's up to you, but then you don't get a drink at lunch also. So, so take your pick. Okay, let's raffle off. Let's raffle off Mark English's 2018 <laughs> Skipper's Bag. <laughs> <laughs> and to avoid any seeming impropriety, and would you mind picking a ticket for us? If you pick your own, I guess you, you win anyway. What do you got? 9663053. Say that again? 9663053. 9663053. Oh. Hey, there's a winner. <laughs> As we're ready for round two. This is where it's going to get even more complicated. Um, so
So, like I said, uh, I've worked with Scott for since 2015, and about the same amount of time I've been working with Eric, who's I've kind of been his protege. And um, one of the things that we want to get into when we talk about electronics, you can click forward, Michael. I'm not controlling it. You are. Okay. Oh yeah. Great. Or, or your your. He's uh, the left and right. Um, the first thing we want to touch on is, you know, in conjunction with the electronic, with the electronic side of the boat is battery power. Um, you know, the big advantage here, and the first question that most people ask is, is lithium safe? And the lithium technology has come a very long way in the last few years. Um, we're not seeing the issues that we had with humidity causing fires and battery meltdown due to heat. Um, and the nice thing about batteries now is they're becoming simple. There's a much more market friendly option called a drop-in battery that has a BMS, which is a battery monitoring system. It's pre-programmed so that you can drop it into your boat in place of your other batteries. The only thing that you have to be careful of is that the battery devices, chargers, inverters, anything that puts an input into the battery has an AGM setting and that those settings are compatible with that battery. But for the most part, as long as you can switch all the settings to AGM, they're what we would call a drop-in friendly battery. Um, some of the issues that are some of the benefits, they come in the same form factor. So you don't have to go through your boat and rebuild everything if you have group 24, group 31, 8D batteries, they come in a form friendly factor. There are companies out there, people like to build their own lithium banks. They do tend to be a little bit lighter, but again, you have to do a lot more homework and use an external battery monitoring system. So when we talk about keeping it simple, that's the biggest thing that we're trying to do here. Keep it simple, keep it manageable. For example, in the more 24 that we're gonna build, we only need so many amp hours, between 50 and 60 amp hours. We want redundancy, so we're going to put two 50 amp hour batteries in a box and leave one completely disconnected. If something happens to that battery, we can pour it over, use the other battery, and it provides a safety factor. That battery keeps, that keeps the weight down. One of these batteries, a normal AGM battery for group 27 is about 64 pounds. The current Battleborn batteries that we like to use or Lithium Blue that's coming on the market or Mastervolt, they weigh between 31 and 36 pounds of battery. So it's a significant weight savings. The other, uh, the other thing that you get with these is uh, discharge flow. A normal battery gets a 50% discharge floor. So if they say it's 105 amp hours, you get about 50 amp hours, 52 amp hours, you get almost just under double that with a lithium ion battery. It also accepts charging faster. So you have, you can be more efficient with your alternator time, which means less time running the engine, more efficiency from the solar panels, or the other option we'll talk about later, which is hydro generation, which is incredibly efficient. Um, there are lithium batteries that are designed for starting but we're not seeing a lot of luck with those yet, just because some of these batteries are getting better and we've been using them in Scott's electric boat to power everything, electric winches. So they are starting to show promise, but it's not something that I'm ready to put backing behind as a starting battery for, a, for an engine that takes a lot of cranking amps. Uh, they're compatible with solar, they're compatible with battery chargers, they're compatible with alternator power, uh, the, the point that sticks with a lot of people for all the benefits is the cost. They're about four times more expensive than an AGM battery. Uh, you do get a lot more out of these batteries though, so there is a cost benefit analysis to be done. Some of the battery brands, I know Battleborn right now is having a sale and the batteries are $100 or $200 off a normal 100 amp hour battery. Um, and the alternators, the thing that's, that we need to be careful of is alternators with a built-in regulator. We have to replace those alternators with a standard alternator. 
there's a charging issue that can overcharge the batteries and cause the battery just to cut out. Most of these batteries with the internal VMS, they do have a safety feature. When you talk about running a battery down beforehand, if you had a trickle off the battery, you wouldn't use your boat for a month or two. You'd come back to dead batteries. You can't get them to hold a charge. New lithium batteries have a voltage drop. They go from, once they get under 10 volts, they drop to zero to five volts. And you can't have any more draw with 12 volt devices. So it protects the battery until it gets charged back up to 10 to 10 and a half volts. So there's, there's a lot of benefits to these batteries, not just the weight. So we're, we're gonna move into instruments here. And one of the things I wanna talk about is um, Eric and I are big fans of BNG. Obviously, Eric's the one of the West Coast BNG dealers. And the reason for that, and I work with a bunch of different instrument platforms, but in this case for Pat Cup, BNG is a very powerful tool. The reason we use BNG is because you can calibrate it. Most of these instruments, Raymarine, Garmin, you can calibrate the wind angle for a wind wand. You can calibrate your boat speed. That's it. They don't allow to populate upwash tables. They don't allow polar inputs. And when we're trying to navigate with some of these more complex systems like Expedition or Noble Tech, the only way you can get good information out of it is by having good information go into it. So these systems, while they do look expensive, like Eric said, what used to what's a ten thousand dollar system today used to be forty or fifty thousand dollars 10, 15 years ago. So the instrumentation is coming a long way, but it is a very powerful system. The nice thing about new systems nowadays is they've all migrated to the NEMA 2000. And NEMA 2000 is a proprietary system. The only system that does not function on a standard NEMA 2000 cable is Raymarine. Those systems can still be interfaced though with cable switches, converter cables. So a little bit later, we will talk about utilizing legacy hardware, older hardware, or interfacing some devices from Raymarine to BNG. One of the things that we want to be able to do with these instruments is utilize tablets and smartphones. For example, this year I navigated Big Boat series from my cell phone that was connected to our instruments. We could look at the chart, we could get polars up, we could do everything that we needed to have next leg apparent wind angles so we could choose sail choices. And this is a very basic way of navigating just to help us get around the course. But we could tuck the phone into a life jacket, make a tack, go, okay, we're in better current here. Or we could get close to Cavallo Point, know that we weren't gonna be using a kite, that we were gonna head sail reach over to Fort Mason all before we even get to the mark. Um, a couple of options for doing this, NEMA 2000 to Wi-Fi. Most of these systems, we're gonna have some kind of ship's network. On simpler systems, the BNG chart plotters nowadays have Wi-Fi built in that you can connect into via the link app. You do have, it's screen mirroring with control. So from your cell phone, tablet, and now from the Macs, there's a uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the program, but you can tap into your cell phone and you can use your MacBook also to navigate. Um, you also have NEMA 2000 to Ethernet. Most of the higher draw devices or higher information transferring devices require an Ethernet system in the boat. Whenever we build these systems, we usually use a network switch and a router and everything gets plumbed into that network switch so you can handle multiple devices on your system. And then the BNG WebSocket uses this Wi-Fi or existing network. It's a tool to enter into the BNG system for an H5000, which is the system that we normally recommend. For a lot of smaller boats, if you just have a BNG Triton system, which is the basic entry level system, you have the same fallback problem that all these other instrument companies have. You have very limited calibration, boat speed, heading, and apparent wind angle. That's it. It doesn't account for all the other variables that come into this scenario. So it's important to know 
what are the extraneous items that you do need because it's not just the instruments you do need an in, you do need not an internet connection but you need a ship's wi-fi that all these devices can communicate on um like eric said technology is moving forward every day and keeping it simple and getting things in the smallest format that we can is helpful so new instrumentation when we talk about VHF is the Vesper Cortex. Vesper Cortex is what we call a black box VHF. It's an all-in-one system that has NEMA 2000 information running into it. It has um, AIS and it has a five watt uh, transmitter all in one box. So instead of having what used to be four devices, now you're in one device. You're saving space, you're saving wiring, and you're saving power consumption. One of the important things to remember is that you have to have this running 24 hours a day. So you need to make sure that when you talk about your power plan, that your VHF isn't the big consumption point. It's also important to know when you're developing a power plan, transmission versus receiving is huge. When you transmit, that device starts using a whole lot more power. So everything that we can do to keep this stuff low power when it's when it's in standby and only using it as much as we need it for. The Professor Cortex handles everything that you need in one box as far as VHF, AIS, and some uh, NEMA 2000 connectivity. When we get it back into instruments here, again, we've, we keep coming back to this price differential between then and now. But it's important to know that you have to monitor it. when you're using things like Expedition to their full power, you're getting good data, heel, trim, rudder angle, uh, speed, the paddle wheel is incredibly important. How many of you have boats that have paddle wheels? You know if they're on center line or if they're off to the side? And are they the tri-users that have speed and depth or are they a single paddle wheel? It has the fastest read rate, that's correct, but it takes a little more infrastructure to get that into the boat. When we talk about getting good information in, you will, some boats can't have it because there's infrastructure in the boat. There could be a brace running along the floor. There just may not be a practical way to get your paddle wheel on center line. With these new systems, now we're putting multiple paddle wheels in the boat. Because what happens if your paddle wheel's off to one side on the boat, you're going to get a different speed reading from tack to tack. We get more people that come into the rig shop saying, I've got better performance on starboard. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing we point to. Then we start squaring and making sure the rig is square and everything. But making sure that you also don't have that tri -deucer. There's a lot of problems with those in the past where the depth would go out, they'd refract off of the keel. We try and separate those now because also just having that paddle wheel be that far off the center line of that fitting gives you a speed differential. For example, in the J70s, we'd spend days down there, we'd grind out the little key that holds the paddle wheel in place and we try and angle it to get the speed reading proper. And we still do that with most of these modern boats, but it means leaving the paddle wheel in place when you get it right. And if you're an in-water boat, having a diver with attention to detail that can clean a paddle wheel. If it's on center line and the readings are good, we like to leave them out. Use the blanking plug, keep them clean, soak them every once in a while in soda or vinegar just to get any scaling off. Making sure that they're clean and they're rolling really well is important. Um, radar, how many people are going to... Oh, sorry, Buzz. Question about paddle wheels. For planing boats, they can be accurate when you're planing and you've got disturbed flow, or they can be accurate when you've got laminar flow and you're not planing. So, why are they the best? It seems like something infrared or would be better. There are sonic, they're trying to get sonic to the market in a form factor that's going to be acceptable. I think Eric told me the last time I checked in with him on this, the only sonic paddle wheel that he's seen that's relatively accurate weighs about 30 pounds. 
So it's, it's not market ready. The technology is coming along. When we talk about paddle wheel placement, especially for a boat like IO, paddle wheel placement fore and aft is incredibly important. Because this boat can be cleaning all the time, you're gonna get a lot of airflow coming over. It's important to have that sensor on center line about three feet in front of the keel and knowing where that detachment of flow over the hull is gonna happen. When we talk about things like the Cygnet Blue Top that Paul brought up, for inshore racing, we've gone away from it because we've actually in Key West had eelgrass get inside the holes that are on the paddle wheel and lock the paddle wheel up. All of a sudden you're leading a race and you gotta send a guy over trying to pull weed off of the keel, off of the paddle wheel. Out here, it's not as important. What is important is having the proper placement and the proper paddle wheel. When we do talk about that blue top for guys like Paul Buzz, people who are using Expedition, they want a data log, they want to get the best instrumentation possible, the highest read rates. Is it necessary? Yes. If you're just sailing and you're and you're not worried about data logging, I'm a big fan of the NEMA 2000 paddle wheels that have a slower read rate. Because at the end of the day, you're still getting information as fast as you can see it and react to it. When you talk about data logging, which is a whole, <clears throat> excuse me, a whole nother subject, you want as much data as you can to populate those fields for accurate, for accurate choices. When you're just sailing along, even, and I say just sailing along, if you're not using Expedition to the full extent, a NEMA 2000 paddle wheel is great because it's simple to install. It's going to give you read rates that you can see with your eye and you can react to in a timely fashion. But again, the biggest thing that we concern ourselves with, separate speed and depth sensors. And we don't even put this, the depth sensors through the hull anymore. We find a solid piece of laminate. We pot them inside the hull so that you have the smoothest hull shape available. Uh, radars. I know a lot of people will go with, there will be some people that will go with radar. Some people will send their radar on for the deliveries home. The new radars are leaps and bounds, even in the last couple of years, and I say last couple, three to four years, going from 4G with SIMRAD and B&G to HALO. Now you're getting back into weather tracking, target tracking, multiple radar overlays with two separate bands of radar. So the only thing to remember with radar is it's a high draw function. When you're in transmit, you're drawing a lot of power. And at the end of the day, making sure we're only using the amount of power that we need is important. Um, antennas for GPS. This is, this is a big one because everybody always asks me, you have two GPSs in here, or you have a compass and a GPS. Most of the BNG systems, you'll see we list two compasses in, or uh, two heads, a ZG100 and a Precision 9. And the Precision 9 is quite expensive, but what it allows you to do is get precise heading readings and heel pitch and yaw. Um, the ZG100 is we simply use for position. If you do have autopilot on your boat, the Precision 9 is the required sensor because the heading is so accurate that BNG makes that a preferred method of recording heading. Uh, any questions up to this point? Yes. Just for Cortex, is it available? Yes. We've we've installed quite a few of them. Eric has actually been working with me. I know, I don't think I see Bob Walden here. Bob Walden's got it. Uh, Buzz has it. Um, it's, not, it's not really available commercially yet. You can't go to a store and buy it because it's an AIS. Technically, AIS systems are supposed to be set by a manufacturer's rep. So it still requires a, a dealer's license to purchase best for Cortex. And that's the Cortex VHF AIS for the C, ECS and AIS for Super. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a very, and it's, it's in a form factor of about five by five by three inches. And the only downside to it, in my opinion, just because I've got limited access to it myself, but having worked on everybody's boats that I've installed on, the one feature that I do not like about the system, because the, the receivers are basically like iPhones, touch screen, really beautiful interface. 
the AIS range runs much further than normal screens run. Um, there's not a key lock, which if you're not touching the thing, it's great, especially if you use the wireless and you tuck it in a pocket, you can key the instrument all over the place. You can change screens. So we're working with them on getting a key lock. But the interface is quite nice. It's very form functional. Some people do find it to be a little bit too much because there's so much information and so much functionality on it. But we're working with Vesper to create page configurations so that you can slim it down to just what you want. Any other questions before we move on? Leaving aside the Vesper Cortex, if you were putting in a new AS transmitter, do you recommend class A? Class A is a big step. I mean, you're talking about licenses and class, class B for what we're doing is, is perfectly fine. Okay. Class A gets into a more of a commercial side. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're backwards. You mentioned uh, the lithium battery provider in the state right now. Do you mind? Uh, Battleborn. And Battleborn is one of the companies that we've had the most experience with, whether it's in power boats. We utilize them in all of our electrified boats that we're doing in our shop. And you know, when I talk about starting batteries, we've actually been using Scott's boat as a test platform where we're using it for powered winches, engine starting battery, the whole nine yards, so we can actually put it to the test. But we're talking about a 15 horse Yanmar with that with a small alternator. So you're not putting a lot of load on this battery to get the starter to turn over. Thank you. Yeah, Paul. I've had very good luck with older, cheaper radars for intercepting flaws, well, or avoiding on the boat. But if the primary use of the radar, actually the only use of the radar, is going to be for, for swamp tragedy, is there really any reason to get something uh, fancier than the low end? Well, when we talk about legacy hardware, if you're trying to get an older radar, they're changing cables and they're changing interface. They're, well, I hate older one, but a cheap one. The, the better ones seem to be much better at distinguishing between rain and other things that you want radar to use. If your purpose is yeah, and that problem, I believe, was in my experience, has been addressed with the new Halo radars. If you have a cheaper radar, that that's that's something you have to consider. How are you, if you're going to use a more powerful system like a B and G system, can you get that to interface, or do you need to have a completely standalone system just to run the radar? The 4 the 4G did not track squalls. That was that was the biggest complaint. Why you're going to market a radar to sailors and not be able to track squalls? So that was addressed with the Halo. And when we talk about radar in general, if you've already got the system on your boat and the infrastructure in place, you're all you're all talking about a pretty stabilized price point across the board, unless you're talking about bringing a piece of legacy equipment into the equation. So, uh, you know, radar is going to run just about $2,400, $2,500 for a new dome. And they're all getting to be pretty much across the board. The only thing that I really have a strong feeling on in the radar arena is wireless. Anything wireless, aside from Wi Fi and apps, when you talk about device connectivity via wireless, it's not there. I mean, Raymarine quantum radar. I put one on for a client who just did not want to pull his rig down. And then he came back and said, well, I, I go, I hit a wave wrong and the thing fritzes out and then it's got to reconnect. And, you know, if you're trying to navigate somewhere, radar is hugely important. And I think with some of the newer devices, especially if you're not familiar with it, radar over chart overlay gives you a really good idea of what you're looking at, unless you have a lot of training and reading a radar on its own. Yes. Uh, the uh, radar dome position on the back stay, pull off the trans on, up above on the mast. Where would you ever prefer to go? That's so we actually have a guy at the shop who's returned from spending three years cruising around the world and he moved his radar from his mast to a pole to his back stay. And the biggest thing, in my opinion, about that is if you can get the radar, if you, if you have your heart set on getting the height. The new radars have about a 25 degree beam, so they can account for boat keel and not just have one side be solid reading and the other side be pointed up into the sky. 
you get into weight aloft. That's the biggest consideration with mounting a radar up the mast. And depending on the boat you have, if you have a jib or a Genoa, now do you need a radar guard? Is it gonna start doing damage to your sails? The only thing I really have a consideration on for radar is not too low. You don't wanna be running the radar you know, at head height. I mean, it's, it's shooting a beam. It's, it's you know, like people get concerned about having a cell phone in your pocket. So we'd like to see them at about a foot over if you can reach your hand up, you know, eight, nine feet up. Uh, Self-leveling is great, whether it's on a post or on a backstay. Uh, the biggest consideration we have right now, especially from a rigging side and an installation side is safety. We had a gentleman who's a member here had a dome fall off of his mast and hit a crew member. So the biggest problem we have, again, going back to inspecting your equipment, a lot of the new radar mounts, unfortunately, like everything else, just aren't built to last. You need to go up, you need to make sure the installer puts a safety cable on. That is the most important thing you can have. These domes, the powder coating is, or the mounts, the powder coating is gonna go away. There's a big consideration between riveting or fastening. We prefer rivets so that the, fa so that the unit is secure to the mast. Anytime I can, I want a side mount. Gets the radar over the spreader. You can articulate the angle of the dome to read in any direction. So it doesn't, the dome doesn't need to be perfectly off the front of the mast. The only consideration with that is if you have in-mast furling, you can't do it. So just a couple of things to think about when you're choosing how you want to mount your radar. But I think my biggest consideration is normally weight aloft, even though the the weight of the radars has come down significantly. Anyone else before we move on? Well, what did the guy, the, the world traveler, what did he end up? He moved it all over, where did he end up? He's got it on his back stay with the Edson self-leveling, the drifts, and he's still not sure. <laughs> <laughs> the wind blows a different way. He's, he seems to be happy with it, but unfortunately, you know, once they made this final transition, he shipped his boat over to New Zealand and it's still sitting down there. COVID's kind of, unfortunately, COVID's kind of taken a wreck on the international cruising scene. And so, have you heard of Firefly batteries? Your take on those? Yeah, Firefly batteries are great. Uh, not as low of a discharge floor as lithium batteries, but still significantly lower than uh, traditional AGM or lead acid batteries. The weight is still a factor. They're still quite heavy. Um, they were hard to get for a while. And just yesterday, I heard that Anders of Swedish Marine has I think 25 in stock. So I, I'm a big fan of them. But you know, when you have your druthers and the financial can the financial constraint on fireflies is still much bigger than standard batteries. They're what's called a carbon foam battery. So I think it depends on I think it depends on the comfort level, what you're looking to do, and what's available for a price point. Obviously, in this, we'd all like to sit there and say, you know, expense is no option because when you're getting ready to do this, expense really shouldn't be an option. You know, all this stuff is going to relegate back to your personal safety and that of the well-being of your crew. Once you get three or four days out of here, you're out in no man's land. You've got to be confident in the equipment that you're using. So small boat versus big boat. You know, we, we bring it back to the more 24s we have in our shop, Buzz's boat the pie wacket. It's funny, Scott says, oh, we have the big and the little pie wacket. And they're only separated by two feet of LOA, but the big pie wacket is a hugely different animal. One of the things that a lot of the small boats have the availability to go with is just simply a Triton system. You can still export data easily into Expedition, but you're not doing the navigate, you're not able to export data out from Expedition into the B&G instruments. The, i.e. you can't put your polars up on the mass chart. You don't have, you have to have the navigator tell you what you need off of Expedition. So you can still get very good information out of these systems. You just have to modify your expectations. And a lot of that is how much weight do you want to sail with? For example, if some of the small boats are putting in 30 or $40,000 BNG systems so they can get the best information out so that they can have the navigation running so that they can 
have all this information at their fingertips, help with the driving. And then some guys like the Moss, they want to turn the thing off during the day and they just want to sail. They don't, they don't need to look at instruments. So I think some of the small, like, it, like we say, small systems with big potential, but the larger systems, they unlock a whole different world of information. The thing to think about is, is it usable for you and your crew? Do you just need a guideline to sail against? or a little bit of help steering when it's when it's difficult? Or do you need all the computing power and all the numbers? You know, some of these boats hire a navigator whose sole job it is to sit down there and make sure you're going as fast as you can in the right direction. Not always as easy as it sounds when you say it out loud. Um, one of the things that's coming a long way are start line computers, not as applicable here, you know, that's more of a one design thing, so we'll kind of gloss over that for now. Uh, now we're going to come to legacy hardware. When I talk about legacy hardware, that's either integrating old systems with new systems or interfacing one brand to another. I, I've probably got some of the most experience with that. Uh, there are ways that you can get Raymarine to talk to BNG, to talk to Garmin. Anything that's NEMA 2000 will communicate. Some of the issues we get into is if you have older Raymarine equipment and you're trying to get it to communicate with BNG or just BNG to newer Raymarine equipment. Because Raymarine utilizes NEMA 2000, but it doesn't utilize the same form factor on plugs. So the plugs are different. When we talk about some of these instrumentations and when, when you see all these beautiful photos that Eric puts up of premier installations, when we talk about service loops, when we talk about cable controls and, and looming, it gets very hard when you have terminated cables. You either have to figure out how to make it nice at the box and you have to figure out where to hide all this cable or you have to know how to make the proper connections that are going to remain waterproof. One thing that I always want to tell people when you're building these systems, if the junctions, the T's, even though they have little O-rings in them, when we're on boats like the Fast 40 or the Piwacket, we still go around and we self-amalgamating tape all these T connections. Because when you're on a boat like that, that's that aggressively wet, water will find a way. It's, it's the ultimate law of nature. You got to really work hard to keep the water out. Um, Again, going back to legacy hardware, if you just need a piece of instrumentation that works and it's there, there's usually a way we can get it to read depending on the age. The problem we get into is latency. And latency is just a fancy word for lag. So well, you might have, I've got a couple of boats that have old Raymarine hardware on one side of the cabin top and new BNG hardware on the mast and on the other side of the cabin top. And one or the other is always gonna read slow depending on which one is giving the primary information. So if your depth sensor and your speed sensor and your wind are fed through Raymarine, the BNG is gonna read slow and vice versa. So while it can be done, the thing to remember is, is it, is it right for you? Is it the right thing to do? Especially if you're gonna spend the money to put in a new system. And I think when you're getting ready to go to Hawaii, making sure regardless of what you do, that you're, that you're comfortable with the information that you're getting. And Bad information or late information doesn't help anybody. So while we can do it, I usually reserve that more for a cruising aspect than a racing aspect, especially if somebody's on a budget. Any questions about legacy hardware? And Paul, did I finish your question to your satisfaction about the radars? Yeah, I think so. Okay. And Hawkeye or Corey, I hope you're keeping an eye on my time. Doing great. Okay. Um, so I had an interesting discussion with Bob Walden, who's getting ready to do Pack Cup, and he said, "Well, I want to have a set of polars for lighter and heavier." And I think the important thing to remember about polars: polars are a design set of speeds that your boat is supposed to sail at, and you can put it into these systems like BNG. And you can bring up a number called target boat speed or polar percentage. It basically gives you a target to sail to. So if you know if you're not sailing at 96% of your polars, something's wrong. 
when we talk about polars, there's polars that are derived for a fully crewed boat or a certain suit of sails that the boat has. And then there's what we would call offshore polars, maybe where you don't have so many people on the boat, you don't have people hiking all the time. Uh, you want to make sure that you get the polars loaded in. You can get them from a boat designer, you can get them from US sailing, or you can have a VPP study done, which is a velocity projection. Um, and again, calibration is the basis for all of this. Making sure the boat speed's correct, making sure the wind is getting good readings, making sure you've got good heel angles, you've got good leeway correction, which is a good GPS. This is a garbage in, garbage out thing. So if your boat's not calibrated correctly, your polars are always going to be off and it's not going to help you to look at it. Again, most classes, designers, or your rating, your rating authority will be able to give you a basic set of polars developed by your boat. And this goes back to sailing and being familiar with your boat. The more you sail, the more you can look at your polars and adjust the polars. There's a, there's a great story from the Volvo. Um, I think it was Delta Lloyd when they fielded two boats. A young kid got an opportunity to navigate and he says, I can make us look like we're reading, winning the race every week. So I'll just adjust the pole. <laughs> By the time they got to about the tip of uh, tip of Australia, they were ready to throw the guy overboard when the when the navigators caught him. Um, again, polars also factor into expedition data recording. These are these are pretty advanced level functions. There's a lot of guys here that want to record the data, go back, analyze, and see what they can do better. When you utilize these programs as a whole, polars, navigation software, and the instruments, you can get sail charts. It'll tell you what sail you're supposed to be sailing, how the combination sets up. But again, all of this stuff, I think it's important to understand when we talk about instruments, navigation, all this stuff, that's a navigator's job, as I'm sure Paul can attest to. All this stuff only tells you what's happening at that snapshot in time. A lot of people get into it and they think, oh, I can navigate a boat somewhere. And then they don't take into account crossing tide lines or getting into a different wave set or wind changes or angle changes. I mean, everything's got to be done with a grain of salt of I've got the best information right here. Now I have we have to use our judgment as a whole to figure out what's going to happen going forward. Any questions up to this point? Uh, solar panels. Like Eric said, you get what you pay for in this department. You can go as far as custom made solar panels. We also get a lot of guys. We had a we had a handicapped sailor who bought West Marine solar panels, left them up, never hooked them up, and then when he hooked them up a year and a half later, he was upset that they didn't work. Um, Solvane, Sun Power. A lot of these companies are doing really nice high-end panels that have very good output. Um, I think this is an important one now. The number of panels you have equates to the voltage, and you can get a lot of output from what we call less than 12 volt panels. So these panels are putting out three, six, nine volts. They go into a small converter, and that outputs 12 volts. So when you're talking about wanting to design a panel or build a setup, I think you can get more out of it. Now we get into the complicated part. Articulating panels off the transom are our personal preference. You need to catch the angle of the sun. And when we talk about having multiple panels, when you see some of these boats that have panels everywhere, if you want to do that, you end up having to have separate uh, charge monitors for every solar panel, because if you have all these panels going into one charge monitor, if one panel gets shaded, they all reduce efficiency. So when you talk about using something like a less than 12 volt panel on a boat like IO or a more 24 or an express 27, you want the smallest panel you can to have the most sunlight it can get. Ideally, that panel has 100% sunlight. That way you can that way you can get more panels consuming sun all the time. 
solar, you can get out there and you can have cloudy runs for days on end where you're not gonna get great solar production. It's very important that you have your panels operating at all times. Um, again, we touched on the, on the solar controllers. You know, the more panels you have, it's my preference to have more controllers. But again, we're talking about a weight versus space savings, especially when you get into some of the smaller boats. I think that's just a couple more minutes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think we're in the home stretch. Uh, hydro generators. Uh, Ed Hoff is here. We've got a hydro generator on his boat, and we're getting ready to do a few more on a couple other boats. And we had one in the last pack cup on a Hansa 505. I can't tell you how impressed I am with hydro generators. It is. You can get different pitch crops. You can get some that have auto varying pitch. At about five to six knots of boat speed, you're getting 20 amps of power, and that's pretty much full autonomy. And when we talk about lithium ion batteries, being able to take as much charge as can be thrown at them, you're, you, you are getting a lot of bang for the buck. The only consideration I think in this is drag. You know, when we talk about weight, I think it's I think it's something you do have to factor in, but again, we try and size these units and place them on the boat where you can have the smallest unit available. And we've taken it upon ourselves to completely customize them. So we're not dragging around a lot of extra weight. And when you consider if you can get 20 amps of power for 30 minutes into a lithium bank and then pull the thing out, to us, it's a, it's a win. Um, we're actually gonna take one this year. We're going to do multiple purpose with it. This is for a very small boat. So it's not something that we're gonna advocate that you would use on a bigger boat, but we're gonna use a very large hydro generator for power consumption and as an emergency rubber. The body is aluminum and we feel like for that size boat with the right amount of rate that we can use it as an emergency steering system. So now we're reducing the need for either a standby emergency rudder or a drogue. Well, well, the drogue, go ahead. Question about drag. Is there a way to anticipate how much uh, speed reduction you're going to have for a given boat speed? I think, Buzz, for, for a boat like yours, when you're talking about a boat that has such dramatic swings in boat speed, like a planing versus displacement boat, I think there's a couple of things that you have to factor in. Um, either a variable, spit, a variable pitch prop, or you can downsize the prop size so that you can trade, you can either say, okay, we think we're gonna be averaging this much speed. For example, most of these power curves, if you're doing eight or more knots, regardless of the prop size, you're at full power autonomy. And so you're trying to reduce as much drag as possible. Is it, is, is it reasonable to want to change the prop on these? You get into a couple of small washers and a, you know, an M6 socket head. I don't think it's realistic, but when you talk about, you know, 30, 40 minutes twice a day of drag versus all the weight that you're going to keep off your boat, I would, I would make that decision in a heartbeat. You know, we're going to run some of these boats with a solar panel and a hydro generator. It's not unheard of that you're gonna have a very slow trans pack. Maybe you're a little too close to the high and you don't have the boat speed to run the hydro generator. Chances are it's gonna be pretty sunny and your solar panels are gonna do a good job. Carl asks, I think all the questions come from Carl. <laughs> How small of a boat might hydro make sense on? We're putting one on a more 24. Uh, you know, it's, we're, we're probably, the constraint that we have for what we want to do, we wanted to use the racing generator that had the variable pitch prop, but the shaft of the motor isn't long enough for what we want to do is the emergency rudder backup. So we're probably going to go with an intermediate size prop, but I think they had every year they're coming out with more and more of these hydro generators and the technology is getting better and better. One of the things when we talk about solar generation and hydro generation, 
that Watt and C really was smart with is on their inverter, you can use your inverter for the Watt and C as a solar inverter as well. So you're again, scaling everything down, keeping less weight on the boat, making the system simpler. Yeah, John. How much do they cost? Base price, I would say for a cruising boat, you know, and they call it a cruising situation, but the racing one is not right for everybody. Starts at about $6,000 just for the unit itself. And the one thing that we're looking into as well is Scott and I have talked about whether or not it makes sense to purchase one or two for the shop and rent them out for events. Just because it doesn't make sense for everybody to purchase one of these and have it sit in their boat or their garage and use it once every other year. However, if you're going to do some long range cruising, I think it's a worthwhile investment for what you get. Uh, fuel cells. I The only experience I've had with a system called an EFOI was on a boat down in Redondo Beach. And to say that I wasn't impressed or didn't understand it is an understatement. Um, they're being used more on IMOCAs. And I think this was really before hydro generation became viable to the commercial side. They're, they're complicated systems. You still have to carry fuel, they generate heat, and they generate byproduct. Um, along with being incredibly expensive. I think the base EFOI system is around $12,000. And it's, it's the footprint of probably a medium sized suitcase. Um, you know, the only other thing I want to touch on before we wrap this up is wind generation, just because usually I get a question or two about it. It's not there. It's everybody that, that has it on their boat just says it's not worth it. And again, when we're talking about going to Hawaii, too much drag, too much drag that you can't get rid of. At least the uh, hydro generator does not have to be fixed in the water. You can, it comes with a little kick up that you can lift up out of the water. Um, so that's, that's our preference. Um, any other questions just as we wrap up? Yes, ma'am. Is there any no brick? It doesn't spill easily. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's, good to, it's good to know that when I did this talk for the YRA, nobody had my email address. <laughs> Um, I do want to give a big shout out to Laura Munoz at YRA. This was a PowerPoint presentation that she put together for Eric and I the last time we gave this discussion. Um, but yes, the email is esamrigging at gmail.com. Um, and I think we're going to go into a coffee break. Yeah. So I do have some more photos on my computer just showing some of the things that we find that are a little bit frightening when we talk about wire chafe. And especially when you think about wire chafe in a boat, if you get two conductors, negative and positive, that fray together and then contact, you're going to have a short. If the fuse isn't going to pop, that short can rapidly turn into a fire or a melting issue. So it's really important to make sure that we're mitigating that stuff. So I also encourage you to stop by. We have some displays. Uh, the very last thing I promise, Hawkeye. Yeah, cool. When we talk about VHF cables and antennas, the antenna is only one part of it. The cable is, I would argue, more important than the antennas. And, you know, we do like using Eric's Ultralip that he's designed because it's small and it meets the minimum requirement. But when you see the three decibel, what I call a cruising antenna, that we also sell as the backup antenna for sailing, when we put those big antennas up, it's amazing the reach that these antennas get. The ultra whip satisfies what you need, but when you talk about wanting to get out there and make contact, especially if you're in an emergency situation with a backup antenna, that 36 inch three decibel antenna, it's a monster. But it, most of the stuff when we talk about cable choice is about power loss over the run of the cable. It's really important that your mass cables, it is part of the pack cup SER that your cable meet the requirement for the length of your run. The boats that we usually get into trouble with, just as food for thought, Benetos, your nose, Hamzas, where the boat side of the cable, the mass side's the easiest thing we have to deal with. 
when they build these boats, they lay the wires in the headboard and then they glue the headboard down on top. And 90% of the time, I have no idea why, they put big looms for the wires and then they just put the VHF cable into the glue. So when you wanna pull a new wire through the boat side, it becomes incredibly difficult to do. So we have to get creative with that stuff. But that's all I have guys. And I really appreciate the attention. Thank you very much.